The interagency UAS program has been evolving rapidly over the last few years. The different missions that are provided have enhanced the agency's work in many ways. We will focus this discussion on its integration into wildland fire operations. There is an increasing need for the contracted Type 1 drones to perform intelligence, surveillance, and recon. The use of unmanned aircraft has proven to help incident management teams with live feed infrared during low visibility and night operations. Aerial ignition with the Ignis system is also in high demand. The implementation of UAS for aerial ignition is reducing exposure to personnel and is essential when poor visibility hinders manned aircraft. Today we have Gil Dustin, Justin Baxter, Matt Dutton, Adam Ridley, and Steve Stroud to explain the UAS positions and how they conduct operations safely. There are a multitude of federal policies that govern the UAS program. We all work under the umbrella of the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. All of our interagency remote pilots are carded by the FAA as remote pilots under Part 107. We also have Department of Interior policy and U.S. Forest Service policy. The National Wildfire Coordination Group governs our operational standards, and for UAS, we have a standards guide called the Interagency Fire Unmanned Aircraft Systems Standards. There are four UAS positions cataloged in our Incident Qualification and Certification System. They are UAS Manager, UAS Pilot, UAS Data Specialist, and UAS Leader. All four of these positions can be plugged in uh, based on the scenario we have in play and the objectives we have for UAS on an incident. And I'm going to throw this over to Matt and he's going to talk about our training and qualifications process. When we think about the four UAS positions we use on, on incidents, wildfire incidents in, in particular, um, the pilot position is probably the, the position that's we're utilizing most often, most heavily, type 3 and type 4 UAS. Fly, situational awareness flights, IR flights, mapping flights. Um, with the formal training through NWCG that we do have for our pilot is uh, S-373, which is uh, Unmanned Aircraft Systems Incident Operations. And that training is really about safety of flight, operating on incidents in what we call the fire traffic area, integrating with manned aircraft, communicating effectively using the language that uh, manned aircraft expects on an incident. Um, the process of becoming a UAS pilot or any of the four positions that Gil had mentioned starts with becoming a remote pilot for the federal government. So it starts out with A450. Once you go through the A450 class and some IAT pre-work, that gives you the prerequisites to then start the process of becoming a UAS pilot. So Matt and Justin, there's essentially two weeks of classroom training before you can actually go out on a fire and fly UAS. So is there any on the job or field training requirement before people are certified? S-373 training is pretty intensive field exercise based training. Trainee pilots through a variety of scenarios that one might find on any incident. We like to integrate different incidents, uh, mission profiles outside of wildfire to include search and rescue, uh, investigations, etc. And successful completion of that training moves a, a pilot training into the next phase, which is kind of performance-based training on real-life incidents. So a, a task book is issued to uh, trainees after they complete S-373. So S-373 is a, is a knowledge-based class, and then what the field exercises uh, that we use is kind of a practicum. Successful completion of that leads to the task book, which pilot trainees take into the field and can use those task books on wildfires, prescribed fire, search and rescue, any any incident. And those tasks that are identified in the task book are all performance-based. And specific to what? What are we asking them to do in the task book? Uh, safely and effectively integrate UAS into the fire traffic area. So the tasks range from what needs to be done or what needs to be accomplished before you fly on an incident all the way up into how to safely and effectively integrate UAS into a fire. So how to correctly speak to air attack or other cooperating aircraft, how to set up and deconflict before any sort of mission is undertaken. So on one end of the spectrum, it's being able to use the radio and communicate to people on the ground, people in the air, air attack, helicopters, and manned aircraft. And then also how to use the aircraft itself, the GCS, set an altimeter, request flight areas and ceilings to operate in. During S-373, we train our pilots to four different scenarios that they'll encounter on 
a wildfire on an incident. One of which is there's no other aircraft uh, in the area. The second is an aircraft shows up while they're in flight. The third is there's an aircraft on scene and how to coordinate and deconflict with an aircraft that's already working. And then the fourth and probably most common is that air attack is on scene. So the expectation as our pilots are working through uh, their task book is that they're put into situations where they not only need to deconflict with other aircraft on scene where there is no supervision, um, but also working with air attack, with helibase to make sure that we can ensure safety of flight and deconfliction. Starting the communication early is also key, but we all know that fire is a dynamic environment. So the plans that Helibase has or the UAS pilots have at the morning briefings don't necessarily stay the priorities for the rest of the day. The number one thing that we want to do before we launch an airspace is make sure that we've communicated and deconflicted our airspace and what we're going to do. That starts with the UAS pilot calling Helibase and letting them know when and where, how long we're gonna be operating UAS. We do not expect Helibase to do any sort of deconfliction for us, but we do want them to know where we're gonna be operating because they're the ones that are gonna send the helicopter up to do the next round of bucket work or the next crew shuttle. So inevitably the message that we give to Helibase of when and where we're gonna be operating, what we're noticing or what we're seeing is that there is a gap in the, the current training for the, those positions that are either manning the radio or the expectation that we're putting on people that they haven't trained or seen before, that the message of when and where we're gonna be operating isn't always passed on to the helicopters that are gonna be out in the field. When air attack is on scene, that, that responsibility falls on air attack and that I think they're used to operating in that capacity. What we've seen with the radio operator in the morning at Helibase might be doing something else um, in the afternoon. And that message that we're operating is not getting passed from either one radio operator to the next. So they're either unaware that we're operating or it's just not something that they're trained on that that message needs to be passed to the helicopter before they launch. And as we're figuring that out as pilots, I think we have a strong culture of doing what's right as we continue to identify gaps, start to close those gaps through education, through training, and through integration of the element of, of an operational period that we're all contributing to. We're here evaluating uh, the, IMS, the Matrice 600 aircraft, Zenmuse X-T2 DJI camera, and also the drones amplified Ignis payload, which is a plastic sphere dispenser, so it the ping pong balls, as they're commonly referred to, has a chemical in it called potassium permanganate. And when you inject the ping pong ball with glycol or antifreeze, you get a reaction about 30 to 45 seconds later. The reason we use ping pong balls is because we can drop it from the air. They ping pong down through the trees and get to the ground level so we can establish a backing fire which generally, ecologically speaking, is more healthy for the forest and it doesn't generate crown fire generally because we can control the intensity of the heat. If we start at the top and bring a line of balls across the top and then step that down the ridge, you create a less intense fire and just generally underburn the large fuel mass that's generated under however many years of conditions they've had since the previous fire. So that's really the intent. We're finding it beneficial because normally we have to hike people down the hill and either fire it by hand, which generates a lot more heat because it's, it's more difficult to get up and down the slope, or we use conventional helicopter PSD machines. Problem with that is generally flying low and slow in hazardous conditions with a manned aircraft. It's very effective for landscape and being able to, to burn large areas if needed. This is more of a pinpoint precision tool and also because of the forward looking infrared camera, we can fly in essentially zero visibility where other aircraft can't fly, manned aircraft. So it's an excellent tool for what's called ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and recon, the ability to look at things when a manned helicopter flight recon isn't able, and they're also not able to fly in what, what's called instrument flight rules, IFR conditions. So we can fly essentially in zero visibility out to about five miles with this aircraft. So it's been very beneficial. The way that we 
start the firing. So we'll take the aircraft off, we'll fly it over to the location. For instance, this one, we were flying from generally about uh, this position here, which is about a mile and a quarter away. And the altitude um, delta between the two is about 1200 feet. So we were flying a mile and a quarter, putting the aircraft at about 1300 feet so that we're clear of any obstacles. The other nice benefit of this is you can see the the white line that's out around the burn area. So that is what's called a geofence. So we can actually clear that geofence and we can build a new geofence. So if we just wanted to burn out this one drainage, we can geofence around a specific area. And then if the aircraft ever leaves that area, the Ignis machine will automatically stop dropping and give us a notification that we're flying outside of the geofence. On the call when needed contract side of the house, better cameras, longer flight times. The aircraft are going to be flying either all day or all night. The idea is to launch them before the helicopters and everybody else spools up in the morning and bring them back into their base long after the air tankers, lead planes, and helicopters is left for the day. And I'd like to hand it over to our data specialist, Adam, to talk about some of the different products that we produce with Contract UAS sensor packaging. Usually you're putting an aircraft up with some kind of uh, product in mind, whether that's real-time situational awareness video, communication relayed directly to a division or branch. But depending upon the sensor package and the mission profile, we can produce a variety of different products. On the tactical side, we're talking more about real-time video that can be relayed directly to either ICP or with some additional technology personnel on the fire line directly. This is an example of an EOIR mosaic that we built for the Skid Fire in New Mexico in 2019. This shows high resolution daylight imagery on the left and high resolution IR imagery on the right, they were processed separately, but as you can see, they match up pretty well. And we used the combined EO and IR imagery to derive a new fire perimeter for a fire that had previously not been mapped. If you just have one takeaway, uh, we'd like you to be aware that there is in fact an interagency fire UAS program, and these systems are out flying every day on fires.